Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites, and today we're going to be answering one of the questions that we most frequently get asked, and that is, what is the simplest way that you can use a 3D printer to make a carbon fiber part? In a previous video, we have looked at the more advanced process of 3D printing the pattern and then going on to make production-ready molds, but today we're going to be keeping things simple. So we'll be directly 3D printing the mold itself, and then without any surface coating or preparation, we're going to hand laminate the carbon fiber part without using any specialist equipment such as vacuum pumps. Now this is a very basic process and it does come with a few compromises which we will cover later in the video, but for one-off and prototype parts, it is still a perfectly viable method. The part we're actually making today, it's a battery box for an electric bike and I'm gonna start off by 3D printing the mold. I'm printing this on our Ultimaker printer at a 0.15 millimeter layer height using the standard settings from Cura. I have done quite a lot of testing with different filament materials for mold production and so far found that PETG offers the best balance of resin release performance and ease of printing. Many other materials may well suit this application, but in particular one filament material I would not recommend is ABS, as epoxy resin will readily bond to it, which is likely to make the release of the part difficult. If you would like more information on the material and printer setup suitable for this process, our printer supplier Dynamism have put together a page on this subject specifically, so I'll include a link to that in the description. The first thing I'm going to do is remove any of the support materials and the adhesion features just using a scalpel blade, and then I'm going to assemble these moulds with some super glue. PETG does not bond particularly well, so you will need to coarsely abrade the mating faces with 120 grit to provide a good mechanical key and then bond with adhesive. I've found that both epoxy and superglue work well for this. With the moulds assembled, we can now look at applying the release agent, and that's a barrier that stops the epoxy resin from sticking to the mould surface. One other thing to consider when you're looking at release with a 3D printed mould is how the layer lines present themselves. So we printed these in a vertical orientation, and that means that those layer lines are coming horizontally like this. I've got this giant 3D printed version of the surface, and the sidewall here would look like that scaled up. So then when we make the part itself, the epoxy resin will mesh into that. And then when we come to extract the part, it will slide out from those layer lines. If we were to print it out in an orientation like this, those layer lines would be presenting themselves like so. And that means when the epoxy resin goes in, theoretically we've got a bit of grip, a mechanical lock into the mold. So wherever possible, you should try and orient the layer lines in the direction that you want to release the part in. Now, this isn't that critical. I have done some experimentation with this, and I've found that as long as you've got about a five degree draft angle, you will get a re release regardless. But if you want to make the molds last longer, orienting it in that direction will help. The release agent I'm using here is a PVA release agent. It's very traditional, commonly used in fiberglassing. It's worth pointing out that PVA release agent is not the same thing as PVA glue. I'm sure to many of you this is obvious, but just in case, it's worth a mention. Generally, in most of my projects, I don't like using it because you put this onto the surface of a perfect mold and you'll get brush marks or white marks. But actually, in the case of a 3D printed mold, the film, the thick film that it builds up, actually works in your favor and it's, it's leveling out some of those lines. So if anything, I'm improving the surface finish with it. Um, I find that a brush is a great way of applying a nice even coat, but it can be wiped on or even sprayed. So with those finished, we can leave those to one side for around about half an hour, 45 minutes until it's fully dried out and then go on to the layup itself. Today, we're going to be looking at the really simple and accessible method of an open wet layup. Now we have covered more advanced processes like prepreg processing and resin infusions in other videos, but it is still perfectly possible to achieve some really good results using this very basic method. And the great thing about it is, is you really don't need anything by way of equipment. All we've got here is a set of scales for weighing out the resin, some shears for cutting the carbon and a laminating brush. And then of course the reinforcements themselves. The carbon we're using today is our most popular reinforcement and that's our 210 gram 2-2 twill. And we've pre-cut three plies here and that will give us a finished laminate thickness of around about one millimeter. And then to finish the back of the part, we've also got some peel ply and that just gives us a nice consistent reverse face. First thing we need to do to get going is mix up the EL2 laminating resin. As with all epoxies, EL2 needs weighing out accurately and mixing thoroughly. Properly mixing a batch like this will take around two minutes of steady stirring and it's best practice to then transfer this mixed resin into a second container and mix again. This ensures that you have no unmixed resin trapped in the sides or corners of the cup. 
The fundamental process of hand laminating is actually very straightforward. It's a case of putting a layer of resin down onto the surface of the mould and then driving this up through the reinforcement. And whenever you put subsequent layers down, you're always looking to have the resin rising up through the fabric and that limits or reduces the amount of air voids and pockets you're likely to get underneath. So put a nice thick coating down here first. With the coat of resin down, we can then lay the carbon fibre. Now, this has to be handled very delicately, it's easily frayed, and you're looking to start the laminate from the centre outwards. So just carefully dropping that down and tacking it into the centre of the mould. And once tacked in place, we can use the brush, without too much resin, because remember we've got most of the resin underneath, to just sort of press and squeegee down onto the carbon. Now if you're working on a larger part you might use a squeegee to help driving the resin through but something small like this, a brush is really all, all that you need. When you are laminating just make sure that you don't use any pressure and drag on the fibres because that will easily distort them which although probably won't massively affect the strength and structure of the part although it will slightly, it doesn't look very good so you're just using downward pressure onto the reinforcement. Once you're happy that the first layer has got sufficient resin, you can then just top it up with a little bit more resin and this is what's going to feed the next ply and then simply repeat the process again. The EL2 resin I'm using here is specifically intended for hand laminating and you'll find that it wets the carbon fabric out really easily without any foaming and it's got just the right viscosity not to drain out of the laminate on more vertical surfaces. Its excellent mechanical properties make it ideal for use with carbon fibre. So the next ply I'm laminating is a peel ply. Now this is a layer that will subsequently get torn off from the part and it just leaves a nice consistent texture. It's not actually essential but considering it's fairly inexpensive it does leave you with a much neater, cleaner finish at the end. The layup is now essentially complete, but what I am left with is this overhang of material around the edge, and the weight of that draping over the edge could cause the carbon to lift, so I'm just going to trim that back to remove some of that excess weight. So that's the first part laminated, so we're just going to move straight on to the second part which is essentially just a repeat of exactly the same process. When you're hand laminating like this you have to pay extra attention to the corners. You haven't got the benefit of a vacuum later on to hold it down into these sorts of contours, so it really does have to be there as you're laminating. Now just pressing down on one side here could easily lift out on the other side, so you have to carefully inspect that when you're pushing down that it's not lifting the material from another area of the moulding. But a stippling action and methodically working your way around it a few times normally helps to eliminate any of that bridging. If you're new to composites but interested in giving this process a go, we do sell a convenient laminating starter kit that contains all of the materials I'm using here including the PVA, carbon fabric, resin, peel ply and ancillaries. Of course, we do also have all of these same materials available in industrial quantities for our commercial customers, but the starter kits do make a great way of getting going on your first project. You can explore our full range of products on the Easy Composites website. As this is an open wet layup, this is the point where we just leave it here to cure at room temperature. You could at this stage go on to vacuum bag these parts, so that would be a case of putting on a breather layer and putting them into an envelope bag. And what that will do is it will help to improve your fibre to resin fraction and it might also reduce some of the void content. If you are interested in learning more about that slightly more advanced process, we do have a video that goes into it in more detail and even explains a very basic method just using a clothes storage bag and a vacuum cleaner. But in the case of these parts, we're just going to come back to them when they've cured. The resin's now gone rock solid and they're ready to release. So we're just going to remove the peel ply first and then pull them from the moulds.
This is the result that we've got straight from the mold. As you can see, we do have these visible layer lines on the surface from the 3D printed mold, and unlike more complex processes such as resin infusion and prepreg, wet layup can be a bit hit and miss on a part like this. You can see here there are some occasional voids on some of these edges that we will need to repair prior to coating. It's into the trim shop to trim down to the rough dimension. I'm using my go-to 32mm permagrit cutoff wheel and then dressing the line with a sanding block. Following this, the entire surface is lightly keyed with 400 grit wet and dry in preparation for the finishing coat of XCR resin. With the surface lightly sanded, I can now go on and make some repairs to any of the void areas. Now, if this had been vacuum bagged or had been very lucky and done a perfect job of the layup, this step might not be necessary. But in reality, if you're doing an open wet layup and anything other than an almost flat part, some repair is very likely to be necessary. Fortunately, it's very simple. It's just done with the same resin that we'll go on to coat the part with. And the first step is to create some dams using flash release tape. You need to apply the release tape before putting the resin on, as otherwise the resin will stop it from sticking properly. And then it's just adhered down here so it creates a dam, so when we fill that with resin, it stops it from draining out of the cavity that we've got there. Here, I'm mixing a small batch of XCR coating resin, but for repairs, the EL2 resin we used earlier in the layup would work equally well. The resin then just needs teasing in behind the dams with a mixing stick and leaving to cure. Once cured, the flash tape can be removed and the repairs then sanded in flush with the surface. With the spot repairs done, we can now go on and apply the gloss finish. Now you could spray an automotive clear coat or just using a brush, you can achieve an excellent and durable result using the XCR coating resin. XCR resin is specifically designed for coating and provides a much more UV resistant, glossy and level finish than you would get with a conventional epoxy. The application method is to brush a thin and even coat steadily over the surface using a method like that of gloss painting. Care should be taken not to overload the surface as this will lead to runs in the coating. After applying the coat, it should be checked a few minutes later for any runs and any excess resin should then be removed with a brush as required. I've left these parts now for about three hours and that's the point where the resin has got to the B stage. So that's when the surface is still just very slightly tacky and this second coat will bond well to it. Now, a second coat isn't absolutely necessary, but it will give me a bit more depth that I can flatten polish into. So to apply the second coat, it's simply a case of mixing the resin and repeating the process again. Epoxy resins, like we've been using in this project, do not contain VOCs and are virtually odorless, unlike polyester resins commonly used in fiberglassing. That being said, you should still work in a well-ventilated workspace or wear an appropriate vapour mask. The XCR has now been left to cure to an absolutely rock-solid finish, and you could at this stage just sand around the perimeter to get rid of these drips and use the parts as they are. But if you're looking for a really professional and consistent finish, they will benefit from being flatted and polished. The drips are quickly removed with a permagrit block, and then starting out with 800 grit paper, the entire surface is flatted back to completely level it. The abrasive is then changed to 1200 grit and the process is repeated. After sanding, the part is polished using NW1 polishing compound, which removes the 1200 grit scratches and brings the part through to a full gloss. So here we go, we've got the completed part. And I have to say, the results really are quite impressive, especially when you consider that we needed no specialist tools or equipment apart from a 3D printer. Now, I would say that if you're serious about getting into composites, I would recommend taking the next small step up and going on to vacuum bag the part. This will reduce the amount of voids that you've got, which will reduce the amount of reparation and finishing that you would have to do on a part like this. If you're interested in learning more about that and many other composites processes, have a look through our back catalogue of videos where they're covered in lots of detail. Thanks for watching. As ever, a massive thank you to all of our customers who do make producing these videos possible. And if you want to stay up to date with new videos as and when we release them, hit subscribe and we'll see you next time.